for some reason, you know, I, I was looking at an Alzheimer mm -hmm. caregiver website last night, and there were some um, people were sort of saying perhaps the best way to try and cope with this is to look at the funny side of it and to realize that there, you know, are some some good things about uh, about dementia. For instance, the fact that you can actually organize your own Easter egg hunt. <laughs> um, and for that, I, I also think you probably have your own surprise party as well, although I'm not sure whether there'd be any guests there. But what I wanted to do is really talk about uh, setting the stage of dementia as uh, talking a bit about the illness. And I wanted to start it off with a question um, that I want you to answer yes or no. Is dementia a terminal illness? Who thinks it is? Okay, so maybe what? Half the people are saying yes, it's a terminal illness? One quarter. Okay. All right. Now, I looked up the history about this, which I found is quite interesting. And um, uh, it's quite fascinating. I have to pull out something from my notes here. I remember actually when I went to school, and many of you may remember when dementia was called senile dementia. Do you remember that? Yes. And, and then um, when uh, you got dementia under 65, it was called dementia precox, which meant precocious. Uh, now, I always thought precocious meant that you were rather ahead of your time, but I guess, I guess that's what it meant. Um, anyways, the interesting thing was that before the, the 1900s, uh, we used to think of, of dementia as being both mental illness and just, because dementia means without mind. And so the interesting thing was we couldn't sort out what was schizophrenia, example, for example, from dementia. And um, it wasn't until 1906 uh, when Dr. Alzheimer uh, first isolated these plaques in a young woman he had looked at, well, young, she was 51, so it's young in my books anyways, um, a young woman who died from dementia, and he found the plaques. Um, but still, um, they thought she had early dementia and senile dementia really was thought to be just aging because before the 1900s, not too many people made it to old age. And so they thought when they got like this, it was just part of aging. And it wasn't really thought of um, until 1976 uh, that they began to say, this is not a normal part of aging. And so it was until then, uh, when the first information came out, uh, oh, this is interesting, um, the, when the first information came out that uh, someone said in 1976, an article written that this is not normal, not a normal part of aging, and actually leads to the death of people. And that was 1976. Now, uh, your response, which is not everybody saying it's a terminal illness, is quite um, quite common. I would say that that's been our experience in asking people, even healthcare providers, don't see this as a terminal illness. And you might think, well, why not? Well, part of the problem was that the history of it was it wasn't until 1976 that people began to say, hey, maybe this kills people. It wasn't even added as a cause of death, uh, wasn't accepted as a cause of death into things like ICD-9 or ICD-10 until 1994. So there's been a very, very slow recognition of dementia as an actual uh, cause of death. And anybody have any thoughts on why that might be? I mean, why do you think we're so, why don't we see this as a terminal illness? Oh, he's got a thought. Well, because they die of something else yeah, at the same time as they have the dementia. So they die of something else. So, you know, and I always try and reframe that, particularly when I'm talking to family members, because do they really die of something else, or do they die of an infection secondary to their dementia, right? Um, because we know that people, once people become immobile and unable to walk or unable to move very much, their risk of developing infection skyrockets. 
And we certainly do know that, right? And that comes from their dementia. But I mean, I have certainly seen people, I, I think another reason why we're so slow to recognize it as a cause of death is that the changes are, are slow, right? So oftentimes people don't see it unless it's a really aggressive form of dementia. So I've certainly worked with people um, uh, you know, where, where their loved one is sitting in the chair, in a wheelchair, cannot walk, cannot feed himself, cannot, does not know what day it is, um, cannot get to the toilet or manage their own toileting functions. And his daughter said, but all that's wrong with him is dementia. Mm -hmm. It's a, just his memory. And you, I, I unfortunately, brutally had to walk her through the fact that he could no longer walk, could no longer feed himself, uh, could no longer manage activities of daily living. So be, there is um, the key study that I really wanted to talk to you about, though, was actually not done until about 2009. It was published in 2009. And that was following 521 residents from 22 different nursing homes looking at their clinical course over the last 18 over 18 months, it wasn't their last 18 months. So they found a certain percentage of them, quite high, died. And they found that a very good predictor, in other words, a clinical milestone that they were in the last six months, was pneumonia. So they looked at people um, who uh, had an episode of pneumonia and found that their six-month mortality rate after the pneumonia was 46.7%. So half of them would die six months from that time. If they had even a febrile episode, so urinary tract infection could be something else, some kind of an infection, 44% um, per of them would die within six months. And if they began to have eating problems, any kind, so swallowing, not eating very well, and so on, almost 40% of them were going to die within six months. We need to start to pick out these things as signposts and to begin to prepare, um, maybe not the patient, because at this time people may not be that aware of what's happening to them, but for sure to prepare uh, their loved ones. The other interesting thing that this study found uh, was that there was a high symptom burden. So people with dementia actually experienced a lot. And I think sometimes we're, we're not so aware of it because they're unable to communicate to us about what they're experiencing. And so they found that almost half the people had shortness of breath. 40% um, had pain, I would say, um, in my experience, it's certainly been a lot higher. And again, I think it's because when people can't communicate as well, they don't report symptoms as well. And they found also that um, almost 40% of them had pressure ulcers. And you know, as you know, we all struggle and people want to report pressure <coughs> ulcers as a sign of, I don't want to say a sign of less than ideal care, and I feel like saying, but I think it's part of advanced disease. And I think that's our, our difficulty is trying to um, prevent these complications and advanced disease that occur for a variety of reasons. And of course they found um, over 50% uh, had agitation. And they found that those symptoms increased towards the end of life. So this provides us with a real um, sort of look and I think three key signposts that we need to be preparing families for. The other interesting thing that this study found uh, was that there was a high symptom burden. So people with dementia actually experience a lot. And I think sometimes we're, we're not so aware of it because they're unable to communicate to us about what they're experiencing. And so they found that almost half the people had shortness of breath. 40% um, had pain, I would say, um, in my experience, it's certainly been a lot higher. And again, I think it's because 
when people can't communicate as well, they don't report symptoms as well. And they found also that um, almost 40% of them had pressure ulcers. And you know, as you know, we all struggle and people want to report pressure <coughs> ulcers as a sign of, I don't want to say a sign of less than ideal care, and I feel like saying, but I think it's part of advanced disease. And I think that's our, our difficulty, is trying to um, prevent these complications in advanced disease that occur for a variety of reasons. And of course they found um, over 50% uh, had agitation. And they found that those symptoms increased towards the end of life. If people who are the decision makers understood the natural history of dementia, their loved ones, those residents, um, had, were significantly less likely to have burdensome interventions. And what they call burdensome interventions, you may find rather judgmental. But um, admissions to hospital, trips to emergency, IVs, drugs, um, those kind of things. Now, not everybody finds that burdensome. And I think oftentimes we do as healthcare providers, and we have to be sure to keep an open mind about that. But um, the interesting thing is that if the decision makers understood the natural course of the illness, they were far less likely um, to, to agree to burdensome interventions. So, um, but the interesting thing was, these people sort of had to figure it out on their own. They asked people, how many conversations did you have, and it was with the doctor, um, about um, prognosis. Only 18% said they did, and expected complications only a third. Um, so the interesting thing is, uh, doctors are not conveying the right information to people. But I would like to say in this day and age with our interdisciplinary practice, um, as a team we need to convey this information. So somehow people were getting this information through their own experience. But to me, I see that this is a way that we can have a dramatic impact on um, the understanding of the decision makers who have to deal with um, their loved ones and dementia and the decisions that they make. And one of the ways in which I like uh, to show people, and I got this slide from the Alzheimer's Society, uh, when I'm trying to convince people that Alzheimer's is a terminal, or pardon me, dementia is a terminal illness, and that people, it affects every aspect of their life, I show this brain, which is a comparison of the healthy brain with um, advanced Alzheimer's. Because I think people sort of say, oh, I see. Um, you know, and if they, then they can sort of understand that no wonder it affects their whole ability to function. And that it's not just that the uh, care home is not feeding them enough, or you're not walking them enough, or you don't have very interesting outings. Do you know what I mean? Because I think it's all too easy for families to kind of uh, misinterpret what they're seeing. So what if people told us about serious illness and uh, what they want? And this was a group of people who were in facility care. They, they had, some had cancer, some had renal disease, some had um, other chronic illness. So obviously they want to be comfortable. I shouldn't say obviously, because not everybody does. Importantly, avoid inappropriate prolongation of the dying process. And most people can get this, right? That if, if it's their time to go, don't, don't make it a, a long, drawn-out process. Achieve a sense of control. And, you know, control for it is, very, is a very individual thing. So for some people, um, it may be to understand absolutely every kind of medication that they have, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for some people, it may be just understanding what's going on, and that's how they have a sense of control. Relieve burdens on families is a big issue for people. And strengthen relationships with loved ones. So it's interesting that people still desire to live and grow, even as they are dying. 
what do the family caregivers want? Well, this was a study done one to two years after the loved one had died. Um, but I'd like you to look at the fact that, of course, they want their loved one's wishes honored uh, and inclusion and so on. But look at the practical stuff, support and assistance at home, practical help, personal care needs, like all these things that we, um, that often have fallen off the, the table for what we offer um, <coughs> at times, what we offer for people in the community um, and, and what we may not have enough of. But also importantly, honest information. 24-7 um, access, like what to do in the middle of the night, to be listened to privacy and to be remembered and contacted after the death. And this is something that we're really finding out that is really important for people afterwards. So along comes palliative care. We won't go into the whole history of palliative care. That in itself is interesting, but it really came up uh, to support people at the end of life with cancer at first. And um, essentially it was for those with a terminal illness who were actively dying. It was controlling symptoms, treating the whole person, supporting the family, and supporting the, the survivors afterwards. However, palliative care has changed. And this is the World Health Organization definition of palliative care. And you can see it's a lot more complicated than it was originally. So palliative care is an approach. So it's not a place, it's not a particular um, medication, et cetera, which improves the quality of life of patients and families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by early identification, impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. So, Palliative care today is an approach, but it's also backed up by medical evidence, and I'm going to show you a little bit of that. We're not only wanting to control symptoms, did you notice the word prevention? We're actually wanting to relieve suffering through the prevention of certain symptoms that we know can occur, and prevention of suffering can also be trying to educate loved ones up front about what's going to happen, what the natural course of the illness is. Because as you know, a lot of suffering comes from what people don't know and what and the surprise. Because much of suffering could be um, expected versus uh, what actually <laughs> happens. And that gap can, be, can lead to a lot of suffering. Um, treating the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, identifying early the people who uh, need access to palliative care therapies, uh, and opening it up now to anyone who has a life-threatening illness. So any time in the illness, people can access palliative care. Uh, as always, supporting the family and supporting survivors. And many people get confused about what is the difference between palliative care versus end-of-life care versus terminal care. And um, our um, Providence Healthcare team developed a sort of a, a palliative care egg. I think you can tell there's a lot of women, uh, I guess we see things in a sort of eggish way. Um, that palliative care is the large thing that encompasses and can be accessed any time. End of life care is really more when you're beginning to see signposts that this person has an advanced disease. And terminal care is really just care in last hours to days. So I hope that might um, simplify it because it is challenging with a lot of different terminology. So uh, I want to show you some data from the US when they looked at the timing of referrals to hospice and palliative care. And they asked people, um, well, first of all, they looked at their data and they found that people tended to uh, a length of stay in a hospice. In the U.S., hospice is a program, but you know they have remarkably similar data to our um, hospice uh, place data. In other words, we use hospice as a place where people go for end of life care. And they found, um, though, that many of the people 
arrived one week or less, or they got in, involved in hospice palliative care one week before their death. Uh, and certainly we experienced that too. They also found that it was quite a while before uh, people got a palliative care consultation when they were in hospital for an advanced illness. And what they found is that when they asked a huge group of people, 237 bereaved family members, asked about the timing of the referral, and 13.7 reported it too late. And those who felt it was too late had lower satisfaction, more unmet needs, lower confidence, and more concerns about coordination. And I've certainly met many, many people who said, oh, I wish we'd seen you six months ago. Now, they might have been singing a different tune six months ago. They might have said, no, 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 I, you know, I don't want, so I'm not making any comment on that. I'm just saying sometimes it's easier to see your life backwards and forwards. The key piece of information that I want to present to you today is a, is a really interesting study, and there are others, but this is the first that was really um, hit, uh, sort of hit people's, uh, uh, it was a well done study, of course a randomized controlled trial published in a, in a good uh, journal which doctors will read, um, put it that way, but anyways, <laughs> New England Journal of Medicine. 151 patients newly diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer. And people agreed to be randomized to either early palliative care versus usual care. And they looked at the outcomes, length of life, quality of life, and their mood. They had the same access to chemo. And in fact, when they looked at it after, the people who had early palliative care also had the same amount of chemo. The early palliative care group um, had better quality of life, and there, as you know, there are rating scales for quality of life, and fewer depressive symptoms. Interestingly, they lived 2.7 months longer than the people who had usual care. Now, I told you, they had the same amount of chemo, right? So, um, and this 2.7 months, you might say, well, 2.7 months, you know, that's not much longer. This is better than a lot of the chemo that they are offered with lung cancer, okay? This is a better outcome. And uh, this really surprised people. It didn't surprise the, the palliative care people because we've often seen people who really um, get feeling better, you control their symptoms, they sleep better, they eat better, they, they come to an, an understanding of what's happening and they actually live surprisingly long time. Um, so this was a very um, uh, good outcome, and uh, I believe they also showed that the same group, the people with palliative care, had fewer um, burdensome interventions at the end of life. So when do you start palliative care, particularly with people with dementia? Because oftentimes, I think it must be incredibly difficult um, when everyone who comes to your facility, so to speak, is already circling the drain. I mean, that's why they're there, because they are not functioning very well, and they are nearing the end of their life. So how do you spot who, uh, you know, who should get palliative care? Well, I would sort of say, why not just make it part of your practice, and that you just integrate some of the things about uh, from palliative care that you think would help you in your approach to people with dementia. Um, and that you begin to sort of practice, as, practice it as just part of dementia care. Um, and uh, ooh, that didn't turn out. What it says at the top is <coughs> application of the palliative care model uh, to residential care. And what I'm saying is, um, that um, rather than wait till you know the person is obviously dying, when they come to residential care, think about starting a palliative approach to care then. And you might say, well, you know, please define what is a palliative approach. And it is a bit challenging. I don't know how that got into yellow. But um, it's a symptom-based approach to care. So. Um, 
you know, for instance, you'd be more concerned about how people are feeling their quality of life is than how much they ate for lunch or dinner. You might also think about, it doesn't make sense to keep checking people's blood sugar values, particularly when we now know that you need to live another eight years to, to benefit from rigid blood sugar control. So those kind of things. So your, your um, outcomes are based on the resolution of symptoms rather than, than what's their hemoglobin A1C and, and what's their creatinine, right? Um, and really try to understand from patient and family when they move in, what are their life goals? And care for body, mind, spirit, recognizing that people still um, have you know, want to solidify relationships, want to pay attention to both the mind and the spirit. The, the yellow there is improved quality of living. And importantly, preparing the decision makers for the future decisions that need to be made. So explaining to them what the natural history of this illness is. And, and I think we need to do better at communicating to families about um, you know, the daily events that they notice, which is trouble swallowing, poor appetite, um, urinary tract infection, shortness of breath, if we connect those with the natural history of this uh, disease and the progression of this disease, um, in other words, by saying, you know, their infection comes from the dementia, the lack of appetite is natural in advanced illness, um, I also think, as an aside, we feed people too much in residential care. Um, and then we say they only ate 50% of their meal. <laughs> you know, so you, I, I really wonder if, if you know, that's the same. Because we feed a, a little tiny person the same as we feed a, a big person. And then we say the little person only ate 50% of her meal. And the family's going, oh my god. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I'm sure most of you probably try and take that into account, but sometimes I think we're worrying too much about the numbers. So if we communicate, I, I, the other thing I think we need to communicate to families is the natural process of dying. So what we would expect in the final weeks and days and hours. And people feel much better. It's often their first experience with this and so they like to know what is, what is normal. And really, I'd love to see that people don't come to residential care and we have to start the discussion about goals of care and things like that. It would be great if that had already started uh, with their family physician, in the community, in acute care, and finally in residential care so that they haven't come to residential care by default. In other words, well, we didn't want to go to hospice because blah, 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 so we came here. <laughs> ah, um, you know, when in fact you may recognize that this person has a short time to live. I also think that maybe our family conferences, rather than talking about how the person is now, should maybe focus on how the person will be in the future. Uh, and preparing the family for what lies ahead. Um, and and sometimes I think family are perfectly willing to accept uncertainty too. Um, but, and I think if we lay out a number of possibilities, uh, that can be very helpful. And, and talking about the kind of decisions that will have to be made in the future, so that hopefully, and maybe even decisions can be made so that they're not made um, you know, on the telephone with mother, uh, you know, like, well, you know, she's got a urinary tract infection and now she's drowsy and unresponsive and, you know, not a, not a good time to be decision making. So I'll just finish. Um, this is an, an old quote, but I think it's very true. The lifespan of any civilization could be measured by the respect and care that's given to its elder citizens and no society which treat the elderly with contempt of the seeds of their own destruction within them. Mm -hmm. So I think we all recognize that. That's why we're here, is to give people 
um, dignity and good uh, care right uh, throughout their life. So thank you very much for your attention.